um, you know, and, and welcome uh, Shyla to uh, Cornell and the Center for uh, the South Asia program at, at here. So Shyla is a uh, sociocultural anthropologist whose research examines intersection, pro intersecting processes of agrarian and environmental change. And her abiding interest is in this intersection um, of, you know, of agrarian and environmental change and to think particularly about how emerging practices of sustainability and uh, from sustainability, you know, from organic agriculture to climate change medication have become bureaucratized, how they've become standardized and what are the kind of implications of that kind of standardization for human environment relations more broadly. And what's brought us here today is to talk about her new book. I have to make sure that I'm in the screen here. I like to kind of have a little show and tell, right? Her new book, Becoming Organic, uh, Nature and Agriculture in the Indian Himalaya. And I am lucky enough to have a copy, but just so you all know, it's open access on uh, Yale, University, uh, Yale University Press's website. So please go check it out. Um, and the book, as we'll hear about today, explores how the rise of commercial organic agriculture um, and with it kind of third party certification more broadly, um, standardized, uh, standardization and contract farming um, reshapes the relationships of nature and agriculture, uh, how it reshapes state bureaucracies and agricultural markets, and how it reshapes farmers and agrarian intermediaries in the northern Indian state of Uttarakhand. Uh, this research was funded uh, by the Swiss National Foundation. Um, oh, sorry, this uh, sort of then that th this that this project kind of comes out of her dissertation research. Um, but what's really cool is like just like recently, like really, really recently, like in the last weeks, uh, Shaila has started a new project um, on uh, accounting for nature, uh, agriculture, and mitigation in the era of global climate change, which is again going to kind of take her to India, but also kind of do a comparative um, project across India and Canada to kind of think about um, new understandings of climate mitigation um, and studying kind of the questions of agriculture and bioeconomies, um, as well as kind of the proliferation of audit cultures and audit technologies around kind of thinking about how to account for that uh, management and that governance. Um, so I'm really excited about our conversation today. Just so you know, I'll also be moderating um, our conversation or Q&A, which will follow uh, Shaila's talk. So feel free to put your comments in the, or your questions in the chat box, but also, you know, at, at the end of the talk, you know, do queue up with your little hand icon and I'll, I will, um, I will, I will get to your questions. Um, but please, yeah, please do feel free to use either modality to answer, to ask questions. Um, so with that, um, I'm going to hand the, the, the Zoom floor over to Shyla um, for her talk. So thank you so much. I'll clap. <laughs> Thanks so much, Sarah. Um, yeah, thank you for the, the opportunity to, to share my work with all of you uh, in the South Asia program um, and to you for being, all of you to, to you for being here uh, on a Monday, Monday morning, Monday afternoon here in Geneva. Um, I should also say thank you to Gloria, who is very kindly going to share my slides since um, that function didn't seem to be working on my Zoom today. Um, but yes, I'm also very much looking forward to the questions and discussion. Um, so with, without further ado, I will, I will get started. The central Himalayan region in what is now the state of Uttarakhand has long occupied a prominent place in the ecological and religious imagination of India. Today, it's popularly known as Dev Bhumi, or Land of the Gods, an expression that links its landscape with Hindu mythology and scripture. And next slide, please. In the late 18th century, the region was described on an East India Company map through the words, quote, extensive forests full of bears and monkeys, unquote. More recently, in the 19th and 20th centuries, these forests became what Ram Guha famously called the unquiet woods. Peasant rebellions against colonial forestry and post-independence forest extractivism rippled across the region, seeding movements for autonomy and statehood that would only be realized with the onset of the new millennium, when Uttarakhand gained its independence from the larger, more populous, and mostly plain state of Uttar Pradesh. In these and subsequent decades, Uttarakhand has given rise to some of India's most renowned environmental movements and environmentalists, and also to an elision of Hindu nationalism and environmentalism. Yet even as Uttarakhand occupies a central place 
in these environmental, religious, and political imaginations, it has remained at the margins of some of India's major agrarian transformations. I've conducted research in Uttarakhand since 2005, and my work there has provoked an enduring interest in the relation of nature and agriculture within and beyond the region, as Sarah mentioned. These are domains that Arun Agarwal and K. Shiva Ramakrishnan note have long been understood and governed as distinct realms within South Asia and beyond. Inspired by approaches in anthropology, political ecology, environmental history, and science and technology studies, my interests cohere around agrarian worlds, a term that I use to capture the way that agriculture composes and is composed by spatial and temporal assemblages, as well as social and cultural relations that are human and non-human and that draw together much more. Capital and finance, science and technology, infrastructure and regulation, gendered, racial, ethnic, class, caste, and other forms of identity and identification, affect and moral, and moral sensibility, to name a few. Next slide, please. My thinking about agrarian worlds developed through the research I conducted for my recently published book, from which the title of this talk is drawn and which uh, Sarah just generally, generously uh, described and spoke of. Becoming Organic explores the arrival of certified commercial organic agriculture in Uttarakhand via the work of a new state agricultural bureaucracy, the Uttarakhand Organic Commodity Board, which was established shortly after the state was formed in the year 2000. In Uttarakhand, organic agriculture emerged in a landscape where histories of human environment relations, development, and modernity are notably distinct from those places where organic movements initially took root. In Britain, Europe, and North America, organic agriculture emerged in the early and mid 20th century in response to the, to the advent of urbanization and the mechanization and industrialization of agriculture. As early proponents of organic agriculture sought to establish more mutualistic relations with nature, they often adopted what one of the movement's principal advocates, Albert Howard, called nature's methods. Still to this day, organic is often naturalized as a physical or material property of land and its produce. Um, and the, I think, popular notion that organic food is innately purer than conventionally produced food, I think, is, is one, um, one way that we can, we can see this. But my book troubles the idea of naturalizing organic in this way. Instead, my work seeks to provincialize organic by conceptualizing it as a relational quality that is produced from historically situated social, cultural, economic, and political practices. To do this, my study draws inspiration from commodity histories and more broadly biographical accounts of the social life of things. But it departs from these studies in that it doesn't follow a particular commodity or focus on a specific comestible as Sidney Mintz's pathbreaking work, Sweetness and Power did with sugar. Um, and as many other wonderful studies have done since. Instead, my work tracks the assembly or the making of organic quality, a quality that traverses commodities and their spaces of production. In this pursuit, my work is in dialogue with recent anthropological interests in questions of quality that richly describe and unravel its material and sensorial dimensions. But unlike those qualities that are embodied, for instance, in artisanal cheese, wild salmon, heritage pork, and even mass market black tea, um, as in Sarah's work, organic is a quality that is largely imperceptible in any obvious physical, sensorial, or material sense, despite the material practices and physical labors that are involved in its creation. The seeming imperceptibility of organic quality is one of its striking features, and I see it as consequential for understanding both how organic is constituted 
and for what its constitution can tell us more broadly about contemporary human environment relations within agrarian worlds. Organic quality takes shape across multiple spaces, practices, and registers. In Uttarakhand, it is assembled through practices that range from making compost to keeping documents in settings both institutional and agrarian, and in registers that are among other things, discursive, regulatory, and effective. Tracing the assembly of organic quality necessitated working within and across multiple different locations. These included the state capital of Dehradun, and specifically the headquarters of the Uttarakhand Organic Commodity Board, other state government offices, and the state archives, as well as in agrarian locales in the surrounding Dune Valley to the south and west of the capital, and in the village of Nagtari, uh, which is about three hours away from Dehradun in the lower Himalaya. My ethnographic research explored practices of organic certification, contract farming, composting, and agricultural marketing. And this meant that my interlocutors were not only farmers and bureaucrats, but also agricultural extension workers who worked for the organic board certification inspectors employed by the state's organic certification agency, and technical advisors for Hira Foods, uh, a large Indian rice retailer that had a contract farming arrangement with farmers federations in the Dune Valley uh, to produce organic basmati rice. To apprehend organic quality in this way, by studying how it is assembled across multiple different sites and sets of relationships. In the next part of my talk, I want to attend to what I call ecologies of enrichment. And we can move to the next slide. The production of quality is central to many agri-food systems and to market activity and global commodity chains more broadly. For quite some time, a product's quality that which makes it distinctive or singular was understood to be in tension with or antithetical to its commoditization. But more recently, quality has emerged as key to understanding commoditization and even how markets work. Within studies of this vein, quality itself is not taken to be an intrinsic feature of a product, but an outcome of a process of construction or configuration that is sometimes referred to as qualification. Actor network theory and recent work in economic sociology by Michel Callon and several of his collaborators um, inform some of these studies and they direct attention to the calculative practices, market devices, and forms of human and non-human networks assembled around a product through its different stages of production and consumption. Works by Calon and others offer tremendous insight into the means through which quality is constituted, but they have had somewhat less to say about the ends or purpose of qualification or about how to situate this historically, socially, and politically. It's in this respect that I developed the idea of ecologies of enrichment to think through the ways in which organic quality is fashioned in Uttarkhand. In recent work, the sociologists Luc Boltanski and Arnaud Esquer describe enrichment economies as those which are characterized by an ever-increasing focus on the creation of luxury and wealth through the production of singularized goods. Enrichment, they argue, is a process which increases the value of objects through physical or cultural means. Um, and they use the example of exposing a wooden beam in an older house um, or through the particular stories or narratives that come to be crafted around objects. While Boltanski and Esquer hold up the worlds of fine art, heritage architecture, and even stamp collecting as exemplars of this sort of economy, I find the notion of enrichment a generative one to think with in agrarian settings. For a start, and in a very literal sense, enrichment has long been a way in which cultivators create value in their fields through the application of manure. And you can see this uh, in the photo in this slide. 
as Heather Paxson has shown in her work on American artisanal cheese, agrarian and multi-species relations are also woven through social, economic, and political processes to form complex ecologies of production. Taking inspiration then from Boltanski and Esquerre, as well as Paxson, I use the idea of ecologies of enrichment to direct attention towards several different locations in which organic quality is fashioned, compost, seeds, and grain, and to trace how cultivators are enrolled in these enrichment economies. So we can move to the next slide. In the spring of 2008, Sunil, a farmer from Dehradun district, dug his hand into a heap of decaying cattle manure and crop residues and pulled out a mass of dense warm earth. Far from an inert substance, this handful proved itself to be very much alive as worms writhed at their sudden exposure to the bright cool air of this March morning. As he beckoned us over to his compost heap, Sunil was eager to show the field officer that I accompanied, an employee of the state's organic commodity board, a recent discovery that he'd made. Picking carefully through the squirming mass of organic matter, he drew out several marble-sized clods of earth. Breaking through these spherical casings, he revealed at the center of each one, a small dead grub the larvae of the harmful root borer. Sunil's discovery elicited an enthusiastic reaction from the field officer who saw particular value in this demonstration of the selective agencies of compost, its ability to destroy pestiferous life while harboring rich multi-species and microbial worlds. Next slide, please. During the farm visits I made with field officers and certification inspectors from Uttarakhand's Organic Commodity Board, cultivators were often eager to show us their compost pits. I soon learned about the many different kinds of pits that could be constructed and different compost making practices associated with them. In the village of Nagthari in the lower Himalaya, a large concrete pit was shared by several houses um, and had been constructed as part of a World Bank project. While elsewhere in Nagpari, as well as in the Dune Valley, some farm households built and maintained their own pits. It would be easy to construe composting as simply par for the course in a system of organic farming. But in Uttarakhand, the pits were potent material semiotic objects testifying to farmers' participation and investment in the organic program. As farmers like Sunil cupped handfuls of a compost, demonstrating its different textures and qualities, compost pits themselves became significant material affirmations of their efforts to become organic. Nagtari residents who had constructed compost pits took care to describe the ways in which their current practices differed from earlier ones. Girish, a middle-aged man from one of the village's lower castes, described how he had constructed compost pits this way. Quote, we use only this manure after preparing it properly in the pit, not simply accumulating it in one place, unquote. Similarly, Sushil, a young man belonging to one of the few scheduled caste families that had a pit, recounted how his family learned about methods of composting from members of the women's self-help group. Before that, he said, we just accumulated cow dung. Now we keep it in a pit. We don't put cow dung in the field, but wait six to seven months. Before this, the grass remained as it is. Now in the pit, it is decayed. Before that, we just accumulated cow dung at any place. Um, and in the lower right hand corner of, of the slide, you can see one method um, of gathering cow dung and, and placing it uh, to the side of a field, which is, is what both Girish and Sunil were saying that they, they no longer did with, with the, the introduction of the pits. For these farmers, constructing compost pits and adopting composting technologies they learned through training programs distinguished their current methods from past ones, 
and separated their effort to become what was sometimes called organic by design from the more traditional practices of farmers who were said to remain organic by default. Building compost pits was therefore not simply a way to enrich the land they cultivated and make it fertile, for this could be accomplished by gathering dung in a heap. Rather, constructing compost pits proved to be a crucial, crucial for a second order of enrichment, necessary for the making of certified organic quality. Next slide, please. Bij Kahan Sehe, where's the seed from? In the winter of 2008, this was one of the questions that was routinely posed by the organic board's internal certification inspectors as they crisscrossed the Dune Valley, conducting internal inspections for the rubby crop of wheat. Although it seemed innocuous enough, the question carried great importance during this particular inspection year. So too did its answer. In response, farmers usually replied garse, indicating that the seed they were planting was from home and had been saved from the preceding year, rather than purchased from the block development office. Um, and the photo on this slide shows uh, a woman from one of the, the households that we interviewed actually showing us the seed that they had saved from, from the previous year. But in the relatively new, um, so sorry, this turned out, uh, the, the response Garse uh, from home turned out to be the right answer, though it went against longstanding agricultural extension advice to farmers to diminish or abandon their seed saving practices and instead regularly replace their seed stock in order to maximize yields and preserve seed purity. But in the relatively new context of organic farming, seed purchased from the block had become somewhat anathema because the seeds were typically chemically treated to prevent pest and disease infestations. This use of treated seeds is strictly prohibited under India's organic standards. Um, and we can see the next slide now. Thanks. So because land and its produce, or sorry, because land and not the produce grown on it receives certification, uh, these standards are applied to all crops grown on any land that is either certified as organic or in conversion, regardless of whether or not the harvested crops will be eventually sold as organic um, or sold as certified organic. Um, and in this instance, farmers were using the land to grow organic basmati rice in the Kharif, uh, the monsoon season. But at the time, there was no market for organic wheat um, in the, that they grew in the rabi season. Nonetheless, they were required to abide by organic standards for wheat um, because, because they would be growing rice on the same land uh, in, the, in the monsoon season. So at the time of my field work, uh, this standard proved difficult to realize. Certified organic wheat seeds were not readily available given that there was not much market demand for organic wheat. This created a problem for the certification of wheat during the rubby inspections, for the use of chemically treated seed is construed as a major non-compliance, one that can lead to the expulsion of farmers from the organic program. Organic seed standards for seeds and plant material, as you can see on this slide, uh, seem to be fairly black and white. Their power is both disciplinary and punitive and it establishes clear cut boundaries by which farmers must abide. In the selection of seed, it would appear one either complied or did not. But as I discussed the issue with third party certification inspectors, I learned that organic quality could also emerge through different practices. Next slide, please. In circumstances where neither certified organic seed nor chemically untreated seed were available, inspectors interpreted and implied the standard differently. In situations such as the one that prevailed for wheat, third party inspectors told me, chemically treated seed could be used. However, in order for this to be permissible or certifiable, 
um, they emphasized, two conditions had to be met. First, documentary evidence in the form of letters written to the state seed corporation or agricultural universities by the state's organic commodity board had to be provided to demonstrate that steps had been taken to obtain either organic seed or untreated seed. If this proof was deemed acceptable, then chemically treated seed could be permitted in the interest of the farmers participating in the organic program if a second condition was also met. This additional condition required farmers to wash chemically treated seeds with a mixture of a biocontrol agent called trichoderma and hot salt water, and to document this in their farmer's diary. Seeds, the certification inspectors noted, are frequently superficially treated and the chemical treatments can be washed off. The conditional acceptance of chemically treated seeds shifted focus onto the efforts of the farmer and made enrichment an act of symbolic and material purification. As with practices of compost making in my previous illustration, organic quality here was also fashioned importantly around agency, intention, and effort that farmers themselves invested in becoming organic. Here, perhaps more than anywhere else, I think, it becomes clear that organic quality and purity need not be intrinsic in a seed or in a grain, but emerge through the physical labors of washing seeds and the interpretive labors of inspectors who navigated organic standards and the agricultural realities and constraints that farmers faced. Next slide, please. If agriculture across much of India since the Green Revolution has emphasized production and yield, the advent of contract farming for organic basmati rice in the Dune Valley has inaugurated other priorities, not only organic farming methods, but also a particular concern with the qualities of the grain itself. Next slide. Such concerns were expressed through standards codified in lists, tables, and regulations. For example, in the list of government notified varieties of basmati, or as you see here on this slide, in the export quality standards for basmati rice. The progressive standardization of basmati that accompanied its increased commoditization in the 20th century uh, created some of the parameters and frameworks for its enrichment. But these characteristics themselves have to actually be coaxed from the crop. Enacting quality also entailed socio-ecological labor, work in and on fields and plants. In other words, quality, um, the quality standards for export quality basmati that you see on the screen here have to be brought into being in individual grains of rice. And here I'm not speaking so much of organic quality, um, but really of the physical and material quality standards for basmati, which farmers also had to comply with when producing organic basmati under a contract arrangement. Next slide, please. In the midst of a monsoon downpour in August 2008, Dr. Sharma, the technical advisor for a large Indian, the large Indian uh, rice retailer that I call Hira Foods, stood on the edge of a paddy field, pointing his finger at the young bright green basmati plants. Flanked by field officers and master trainers from the Organic Commodity Board, as well as by the, uh, the farmer whose crop he was speaking about, Dr. Sharma sought to draw their attention to the yellowish brown spots on the leaves of the young plants. As he and those around him huddled under umbrellas, Dr. Sharma fervently compared the cultivation of basmati to providing for the nourishment and health of a child. For Dr. Sharma, these signs of brown spot, as well as those of other diseases such as blast, nutrient deficiencies, and pest problems that he also noted on his tour of the valley, bode ill, not only for the final crop yield, but also for the quality of the harvested grain. Both of these were issues of concern for Hira Foods, 
which had a contract arrangement to procure organic basmati from Dune Valley farmers. Though Hira Foods did not maintain a continuous presence in the valley, Dr. Sharma made regular visits to monitor the quality of the paddy at different stages of its growth over the crop cycle, as well as at the moment of procurement, when farmers took their harvested grain to the company for inspection and sale. Dr. Sharma's technical advice dispensed to farmers on the edges of basmati fields, uh, the package of, of practices that he had devised to familiarize farmers with Hira Foods' expectations of quality, and the negotiations and compromises that he ended up striking with farmers during the time of procurement worked to ingrain the production of standardized quality within everyday acts of cultivation. Um, and I can't go into these at more length here, but I'm happy uh, to do so later. The pro production of organic quality then may be understood not only as a socio-technical, but a socio-natural practice, one that enriches the economic value of organic basmati grains through efforts to coax and nurture from them particular physical, material, and even biochemical properties. Structuring this process were a panoply of standards, which not only defined the requirements for organic production, but also limited which seeds could be considered basmati and which particular configurations of physical properties in the grain would render basmati export quality. At the center of this was the contract farming arrangement, which accomplished much more um, than what such arrangements are often said to do, um, which is assure buyers of a supply and farmers of a price and a buyer. Organic standards and physical quality standards for basmati were articulated together through the contract arrangement. This made contract farming instrumental to an economy of enrichment in the Dune Valley and afforded Hira Foods unprecedented access to farmers' fields in order to monitor the production level and quality of the basmati it had contracted cultivators to grow. Uh, next slide. In Uttarakhand, cultivators' labors to make their fields fertile and productive is nothing new. Everyday acts of enrichment are part of agrarian life in Uttarakhand, and they encompass work that we mostly do not see. Repairing broken terrace walls, removing stones from fields before a crop is sown, or changing water in irrigated rice paddies to keep young plants cool. In a sense, agrarian environments always harbor within them complex ecologies of enrichment. But through the illustrations that I've offered here, drawn from my research, I've tried to show how enrichment is mobilized and takes shape differently around the production of organic quality. These aspects of enrichment cited in material and semiotic objects, such as compost pits and seeds, and in different forms of physical embodied and interpretive labor, are not simply incidental to organic quality, but are central to the way that it's constituted. Thinking with ecologies of enrichment then might help us understand how emerging forms of agrarian capitalism arise and operate increasingly under signs of sustainability. Put a little differently, um, if Uttarakhand's unquiet woods were historically sites of extractive activity in India's colonial and post-independence periods, then its newly established organic farms may be sites of enrichment, no less germane to the formations of state and of capitalism in the region. Thank you very much. And I'll be really happy to take your questions. Thank you so much, Isla. That was that was such a pleasure. Um, so again, um, I'm Sarah Besky. I'm going to be moderating uh, the Q and A here. So please feel free again to either use a chat function or your little kind of like hand icon in Zoom uh, to 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 ask your questions. But while uh, you're queuing up, perhaps all of your questions, I'm going to. I've 
I, of course, have tons of questions and I would love to talk to you about this for, for a long time, um, but I'll just refrain and I'll, I'll contain my questions to uh, a finite number. Um, and I just, there's something that just is, it's really like generative kind of think about, I mean, organic in particular, right? And organic quality as the most imperceptible, as you point out, of qualities, but it's kind of cut down to size through these, not just ecologies, but like these everyday acts of enrichment. And what I thought was really kind of interesting just in your talk, and of course it's exploited in, in more detail in the book is like the, the kind of work of inspection from both Hero Foods and the kind of state organic boards um, or in, in organic certifiers to kind of watch people as they enrich the soil to kind of verify or to enrich the, the environment in, in, in trust that it's in fact organic enough. And so I guess my question is like, and you, you come to this in the end of your talk, the kind of collapse uh, with the contract farming arrangements and, and here of foods kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, surveying, surveying and surveillance of these particular kind of landscapes where the organic um, and the con or the, the organic and the export quality kind of smushed together. But my question is like, um, right. So in, in the way that kind of the organic folks versus the hero folks do their work, like what are the kind of prime movers for each in terms of like the work that makes each, like what are, what are kind of each looking for, right? And a kind of everyday surveillance trip, an everyday inspection trip, um, right? So often, right, no matter where we're talking about in the world, the compost bin is this kind of key signifier of organics, right? Like the, the whether it's for tourism purposes or for, um, right, for actual real like third party inspection, that's always the first step. And you kind of talk about seeds and compost as these key, you know, sites for, for organic certifiers. And then, but then the kind of, there's a kind of shift when it comes to uh, export, right? Which is the plant health, grain size. So I was just kind of, you know, if you can kind of walk us through both of those kind of observations. Right, like what are the state inspectors kind of looking for? Like where does organic sit? And then, you know, kind of maybe for, for Hira, where does organic sit? That kind of makes sense. Thank you. No, that's a fabulous, yeah, really fabulous question. And I think really also brings these practices of surveillance and inspection together, but also you're also kind of gesturing to what makes each distinct because they're not, um, you know, they're not surveilling and inspecting necessarily for the same, the same things. Um, and so I think for, for inspectors within the organic commodity board um, and in the third party certification agency, you know, their remit was really focused more on the organic standards. Um, and so they were, looking at the inputs farmers used. And so seeds obviously are, are a crucial input. They were looking um, for other, you know, looking for other possibilities for non-compliance with organic standards. So um, they would want to ensure that farmers were not growing the same variety um, in both organic and conventional fields. So that's called parallel production. They're looking for that, which is another kind of boundary setting um, practice, right? The, in separating and distinguishing organic um, and conventional. They're looking at buffer zones and the distance but, and, and sort of interpreting what constitutes an adequate buffer zone um, given that far, farms in, in Uttarakhand are not sort of the, the kind of grids um, that um, are more typical in, in North American landscapes. Um, farm, farms are small, non-contiguous non um, and, and fields uh, similarly. So, um, so yeah, inspectors in the board and, and third party certification inspectors are really kind of in some sense concerned with organic quality, um, but the Hira Foods is, is ultimately concerned, in a sense they take, there is a division of labor. If the organic board and the third party agency are, are kind of managing the organic certification, Hira Foods is really looking at um, the production of the grain and the, the quality of the grain and it is concerned with a different set of standards and standardization processes. Um, and so it is things like crop health, disease, 
um, nutrients deficiencies um, that that are really the kind of prime concern and the prime movers um, of uh, yeah of their of their work and one could see this not only in the moments that I described on the edge of farmers' fields but even in the moments of procurement when they had quality inspectors sampling every sack of rice that farmers brought and really looking and assessing the size, the color of the grain, the presence of admixtures, um, and so on. So I think, you know, in a sense, farmers are, because organic is, is sort of brought into the contract arrangement, it is because the basmati is organic, is produced organically, that there is a contract farming arrangement. Um, they are kind of those those two forms of standards and standardization are, are articulated together within it, um, and farmers have to navigate navigate and respond to both. Yeah, fabulous. That's amazing. Okay, so I see a couple of questions in the chat, so I'm just going to answer uh, offer them up to you, so you don't have to read them. Um, to what extent are organic price premiums an incentive for farmers to participate in organic certification programs? Um, yeah, I mean, I th that's also a, a really interesting question. And I think um, it, it, to some extent, it was partly a motivation um, for, for farmers, but maybe not as much as one might, might expect. Um, so in the Dune Valley, as I said, there was a contract arrangement. Um, but interestingly, in the years that I was conducting my field work, um, farmers, the price of basmati in the market, so at the Mundi, actually became higher than the contract price that they um, they received under through this contract farming arrangement. Um, and for that reason, in in that period, a number of farmers actually left left the program or decided not to. Um, not to divert or not to sell all of their patty to to Hira Foods. Um, so price is certainly, and you know, one reason um, why farmers participate in in the program. But for a number of them, um, and maybe as you had a sense of in the talk, um, becoming organic or being certified organic was a way of distinguishing themselves from what people had said was organic by default, right? It was a way of claiming a kind of um, a modernity that that not not for all, but for some um, for some cultivators was was equally desirable, right? As as desire. So so there were um, there were subjective and cultural reasons for for becoming organic as much as there might have been. Um, economic incentives for for doing so. Amazing. Okay, and from uh, from Roderick. Hi, Roderick. Um, uh, what are farmers? What are kind of the farmers' approach to or relationship towards crop diseases vis-a-vis -vis, uh, becoming or being organic? Um, yeah. So, okay. So farmers' approaches to diseases vis-a-vis -vis being organic. Um, so obviously in an organic system, some of the um, some of the the inputs that one might use in treating nutritional deficiencies or pest attacks are not allowed um, in an organic system. Um, so I think again, there was a different different sort of there wasn't a uniform response I should say to the way farmers responded um, to to this I think for some um, the the kind of question of crop crop disease was was one that that didn't necessarily even have to do with the inputs but had to do with the varieties that they were allowed to grow in the first place um, so some of the organic, Farmer, organic basmati farmers expressed some dissatisfaction with the, the seeds that the Hira Foods had given them uh, to grow, the, basma the variety of basmati that they had been given to grow. 
um, because they said it was more prone to disease, right, than, than the land races that they, they would cultivate themselves, but that, that weren't export quality. Um, so I think that the question of how farmers relate to and, and sort of establish judgments around um, the treatment of disease and the questions of, um, of being organic are, are also bound up in these larger kind of ecologies of around agrarian, um, agrarian production. Amazing. All right, so there's another question in the chat here. Um, uh, could you uh, say more about how locals view kind of organic, like quote unquote organic, uh, since the construction of organic quality, as you argue, as well as clarify, um, as, uh, as well as well as clarify your use of the notion of provincializing the organic. So I guess it's a twofold question: like, mm -hmm. how do people talk about organic, and then what does it what does it I guess mean to kind of provincialize this this seemingly imperceptible kind of thing? Yeah, so I guess maybe I'll take the second part of the question first. Um, so with the idea of provincializing organic, what I'm really trying to do is push against the, the way that organic is often naturalized um, or construed as really being kind of a, a you know, a, an innate quality of, um, of a produce or, or even of land. Um, and through the notion of provincializing, I'm working to show how how organic is a quality that is historically and regionally situated um, and that's how it's also has to be produced socially politically bureaucratically and so on and so in a sense it's it's trying to to trouble this idea um, of naturalizing organic which is also I think a way of um, uh, you know, of, of dehistoricizing it, if, if you will. Um, in terms of how the locals view organic. Um, so, yeah, this is also um, an, an interesting question. At the time that I did my research, I think, you know, the bulk of my research, I, a lot has, has changed since. Um, but there wasn't a large market for organic food and produce in Dardun um, at the time that that I yeah that that I did my my field work in in the sort of 2007 2008 um, period but I think that um, the way if, if I take the example again of basmati rice um, what was maybe more significant for say local residents of Dardun than what was more significant than the fact that it was organic was the fact that it was basmati from Dardun because Dardun basmati has its own particular history and, and claim to fame. It's, it's um, the region is renowned for, for the basmati it produces. And yet with the, the kind of introduction of contract farming and the fact that so much of the basmati is produced now for export, it's actually really hard for residents of Dardun to buy what they know is authentic basmati rice. Um, and so residents of Dardun would express concern um, about the basmati that they might buy in the market in their do not not actually being basmati or being adulterated basmati that was sprayed with um, a kind of aroma to make it smell like basmati. So there were concerns about the adulteration of rice, um, about fake basmati, and and their interest in the 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 basmati that farmers were growing had more to do with where it was from the fact that it was grown in Dardun rather than it, it being organic. Great. Um, and again, if anyone, I'm going to attend to a couple more in the chat, but again, if you have, like, if you don't want to listen to me, ask your question by all means, like unmute yourself and, um, and, and do like ask your question. But um, I have a question. There's a question from Bina here, uh, kind of a twofold question um, based on both of you, maybe perhaps your forms of expertise. Um, so, Venus from from Dardun, right? Why why this region? Like, what brought you to this you know particular study? You know, kind of that 
that every anthropologist always gets asked, like, how did you, like, how did you get to, you know, how did you study what you studied? Like, tell me a little bit about that. Uh, but then also probably maybe based on uh, your ongoing Canadian research and Canadian connections, right, which is much more closer to the ecologies up here, um, I, Vina is also trying to uh, grow fruits, fruits and vegetables at home in New York, which again, you can, <laughs> you can yeah. that one if you want. Um, but like, yeah, like, I mean, it would be great to hear how you came to this. Yeah, no, and um, I don't know that I have any practical advice on growing fruits and vegetables myself. I've tried to do so here and and like without um, huge success. So um, I don't, yeah, I'm not sure I can be of much help here, but I can talk a little bit about how I came to, how I, how I came to this research, I suppose. Um, you know, I've always had, uh, yeah, I, the kind of questions of the agrarian and and agrar the intersections of, of agrarian um, in, and environmental concerns have always been something that that interests have interested me. Um, and so I went to Uttarakhand, as I said, um, I had been in the 1990s, but I went again in um, 2005, which was five years after the state was formed, as you know. Um, and two years after the state created the Organic Commodity Board. Um, and I think what initially drew me is, is a curiosity about, you know, the fact that Uttarakhand was a new state and that it seemed to be trying to chart a very different kind of agrarian trajectory for itself. One that had to do and that drew on the the history of the uh, the history and the kind of ecological condition of the the region um but that also kind of projected itself um through you know through its ambitions to um have all farmers in the state be certified organic to um to sort of ramp up and scale up commercial organic agriculture so i was interested in kind of processes of, of state making and market making in Uttarakhand shortly after its formation. And then maybe as you've had a sense of um, in the talk and, and in the book, my interests have also um, through the research shifted to really be, be driven by a curious, curiosity and around the question of, you know, what is organic? What is, how do we understand organic quality and its significance in and in and of itself. That's great. Thank you for that. Like, question. Really, oh, thank you. Sorry, Vina, was that you? Zoom is so fabulously normal. Um, <laughs> okay, thank you. But I mean, the, like that, it, it's really you know the the kind of environmental questions around state state formation, I think are incredibly important, right? And the kind mm. of state formation in India. So it, and this is a really, really fabulous kind of lens into kind of thinking about the state and, or because I mean, because, right? Because uh, state organics, right? Are kind of this, right? Sikkim and right, mm -hmm. kind of the discussion of, of what it, what, what it might, what, what does it mean? Or what might it mean to have this organic state? And then where are all the ways that, you know, in the case I know more about Sikkim, right? That it, yeah. that it, that it falls apart. Right. Um, okay. Yeah. Right. Like the black market, you know, uh, inorganic vegetable dealers that kind of creep up in the middle of the night. Anyway. Um, right. right. Vina, did you did you have something else? Yeah. I just wanted to add that I I've grown uh, apples and peaches. I have a 13, 14, 14 years old peaches peach tree, and uh, alternate years we have had good uh, crop. And this year we didn't, but we have apple tree and that's about 11, 12 year old, something like that. And um, so, uh, but vegetables, I don't have much success, just the tomatoes. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think I, I get much vegetables as well as that. So, yeah, but uh, I'm from there and I try to grow stuff here, uh, around here, organic, of course. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, very yeah. nice, very nice talk. Thank you. No, thanks for the question. Yeah, it's hard work. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna skip to a hand. Uh, Tashi. Hi, Shela. Thank you so much for the time. Uh, uh, I, I went to school in Missouri, high school in Missouri, ah. and I also lived in Geneva for a while. So oh, wow. in that context, <laughs> we have some similarity. I was just wondering, uh, just based on your research, at at least the organic certification has been going on for at least 13 years. I was just wondering 
uh, in a in an economic state of the farmers who are uh, cultivating their land conventionally organic or through certification program under contract farming uh, is there any uh, sort of like a data out of whose states of being are better like in terms of comparison thank you so much yeah no that's a really important question um and you know what i i think Obviously, this was a young program when I started my research, and it's something that is still very dynamic. But what I, a pattern that I saw um, develop at that stage, and I, that uh, that is still an issue, I think, is the fact that it is farmers who are better resourced in terms of land, but also in terms of caste position, social position, cultural capital, and uh, that that are able to claim or become organic more so um, than than marginal farmers in the state right of of lower caste um, and I think it's important that I think that that is important because often organic is held up as as being um, a, a form of smallholder farming that is suitable for poor and marginal farming households um, and it can be kind of construed and framed in that way um, but yeah I think there's you know there's many aspects um, of organic farming that are quite demanding in terms of for example the time and the labor that's involved um, so for example in Nagpari um, the scheduled caste families would often perhaps have a, a field that was not necessarily their own, but they, um, that they cultivated, but they would also work on the land of others. And so, you know, their kind of labor time was split between their own household and that of higher caste, uh, dominant caste families. So in terms of the kind of demands that organic makes on labor, um, so, you know, having to weed by hand, for example, um, become all the more onerous for households whose, whose labor is, is spread thin and who don't have the resources to kind of mobilize um, or the social position uh, and power to kind of command and mobilize um, the labor of others. So I think in that sense, yeah, organic, the, the, the kind of impact or the way organic farming has unfolded socially has been quite uneven um, across these communities. I don't know if that answers the yeah, question. It did. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. That's amazing. Okay. I have a question from Dietrich and then Nirvan, if you want to answer if you want to ask this this question, I'm happy to to let you do that. But I'm going to get to Dietrich's <laughs> question to, uh, first. How is uh, production of organic quality tied into broader relationships uh, to landscape, uh, forest, streams, household, livestock uh, productions, right? So I guess, I mean, this kind of actually where, you know, you kind of started a little bit too. So how does organic uh, kind of relate to kind of broader questions about the, I guess, the landscape writ large or the landscape perhaps here in particular? Yeah. I mean, I think, um, I think that, yeah, in a sense, that's that's a question that I could answer at one level, but I think there's another there's a a slightly deeper level that maybe I will try and um, go into a little bit. Um, so I think you know one of the things that that in terms of this way of thinking about landscape um, and the relation of organic to landscape, um, one of the ways we can do that is to think historically about the way that that um, Uthorkan's landscape has been positioned and has been understood. And, and I think this was something I tried to gesture to, as you said, Sarah, in the, the opening of the talk. Um, and this is a region that, you know, that people would say has always been more known for its nature than, than its agriculture. Um, and so there's a way in which, to an extent, organic quality could be could, this would be a place where one could naturalize organic quality, right? This is a region that people say has always been organic. Um, but I think, you know, what I saw increasingly through this state effort to become organic and through the contract farming arrangement to produce organic basmati, 
um, is that that kind of certified organic quality that one, um, you know, that is cultivated in commercial production in some ways ha has less to do with landscape than it does with, with particular kinds of, of practices. Um, with particular forms of, um, of infrastructure, with standards, um, with document keeping. And then so at that level, I think organic quality is much more tied to those kinds of, of phenomena um, than it might be to, to the landscape itself, right? In a sense, the landscape is what enabled the state in some sense to project itself as organic because it could claim that it always has been organic. It seems like a kind of logical step. Um, but in terms of the everyday work of producing organic quality, that, that entailed something, something quite different and different sets of relations. Great. Nirvan, do you want to take this one or do you want me to? Yeah. Um, hi, Shala. Right. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, so my question is uh, regarding organic state, but I come from the Eastern Himalayas. So, um, you know, in 2016, uh, Sikkim was um, declared as the India's first organic state and Prime Minister Modi visited and there was much gusto and there was a lot of press and, and you know, we thought that so much things were going to change. But when I conducted field visits in 2018, um, I think I discovered that most of the people continued with the traditional forms of agriculture. Like in short, nothing had changed for the farmers in getting subsidies, uh, you know, for for doing agriculture. And I think uh, because Sikkim has a population of around 6.8 lakhs and they get a um, tourist of around 14 lakhs, there was a huge uh, demand supply shortage in terms of uh, vegetables, right? And those vegetables had to be imported from Siliguri, which is in the Indian state of West Bengal. And, um, and those vegetables, so to speak, were inorganic. Now, I think one thing that people also are arguing was saying that like if we are eating organic and inorganic vegetables, and if you know Sikkim as an organic state was projected at this first organic state, then doesn't that doesn't consuming inorganic vegetables um, defeat the very purpose of uh, declaring Sikkim as India's first organic state? And moreover, one of the things that other people have also argued is that most of the funds that were given for Sikkim as an India's first organic state were used for certifying agriculture land as organic, and the seeds were also brought from outside. So. Like in sense, and what I'm trying to say is that I don't think like Sikkim being declared as India's first organic state really brought about a change uh, to the people uh, at the ground level, right? So my question is this, what is organic in agriculture practices in Uttarakhand that is different from the former practices of doing agriculture? Is there something radically different? And secondly, is an organic quality or uh, more to do with agriculture capitalism rather than with creating sustainable practices at the ground level in praxis and consumption. Thank you. Yeah, oh, thank you, Nirvan. Those are, yeah, it's, it's great to hear about um, Sikkim and um, to think maybe about Sikkim and Uttarakhand together. Um, I guess I'm curious, so when you say that they're eating inorganic vegetables, um, like, I mean, I guess as, as I, in the talk, uh, organic itself is a complex enough term, but then what is inorganic? I'm curious, like what is, what are inorganic vegetables? Are those vegetables that are yeah, in, so grown those, conventionally or are they grown yeah. in what people would say are organic by default kind of? Um, I think like when people use the word inorganic, they meant more to do with because organic state was uh, not using uh, chemical fertilizers and pesticides. Um, so so or, that's what they meant organic by organic and inorganic meant when agriculture was, you know, crops were grown by using all these uh, pesticides and uh, chemicals. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I think um, in, early on, uh, when I began my research, Uttarakhand declared its ambition to become India's first organic state. And I guess Sikkim got there first in, in the end in 2016. Um, but um, I, don't, I don't think, you, you mentioned tourism. 
Um, and I think, you know, perhaps one would have to look at like the different ways in which economies or tourism and uh, is are constituted differently in in, Sik in Sikkim and, and Uttarakhand. Um, I don't think there's been the sort of shortage um, that, that you've observed in Sikkim and that um, this sort of importing of inorganic produce to feed um, a yeah, a tourist population that is seeking um, organic food or perhaps even visiting the region, um, you know, for, for those reasons. Um, but I think maybe to come to your second, or what's the crux of your question is, yeah, what is organic um, in Uttarakhand and how is it different from former practices? This is exactly something that, you know, I was trying, I'm trying to get at and I'm trying to get at in the book. Um, and, you know, I think if one looks at, at composting, say, um, and the fact that, you know, that this question of what, what is organic becomes pertinent and what, you know, what it means to be organic is really to construct a compost pit and follow composting methods that one has learned in a training program or through a self-help group rather than, you know, as um, my interlocutor said, rather than collect dung in a heap by the side of a field, right? Both, you know, in the end, both are organic practices, um, but one is recognized as organic institutionally and bureaucratically and sort of counts as constituting certified organic quality. Um, and the other, gathering dung in a heap by the side of a field um, is what's called organic by default, right? And, or is seen to be traditional. Um, and, is, and so farmers in the region who were participating in the organic program were often called, you know, face, found themselves in situations where they had to distinguish their practices from those of their neighbors, who are organic by default, right? They had to demonstrate themselves to be organic by design uh, in, in various ways. Um, and, you know, in that sense, I would say that, yes, I, I agree with you that, that organic quality in this sense is, um, the, the formation of organic quality has a lot to do with kind of the emergence or a particular form of agrarian capitalism. Um, rather than with necessarily, you know, the sustainable practices um, of, you know, sustainable farming, smallholder farming practices in, in and of themselves. Amazing. But yeah, thank you. Those are great questions. Great. Okay. Anissa, do you want to take the last question? Hi. Can you guys hear me? Totally. That would be great. Yeah, thank you so much for the talk. I was just a bit late, so you might have already answered this because <laughs> you were you did uh, mention uh, about uh, like fake basmati and authentic basmati, like how how people differentiated in a way, and what uh, it made me think about how Sarah would know this better about the Darjeeling tea, right? Like how Darjeeling tea gets exported outside and it's not consumed within the like within the place within Darjeeling because it's expensive. Right, so I'm just wondering, how do you, like you, you did mention that how the people, the residents differentiate, you know, like in terms of what is fake, basmati or authentic. So, but what did you observe? Like was, because I'm just wondering, is there anything like authentic basmati rice? Like I'm, I'm, I'm having that thought in my mind. So yeah, just if you could shed some light on that. Thank you. Yeah, that's another um, kind of, of worms or or plate of basmati or whatever you want to want to call it because I think that's also something that I address in one of the chapters of my book which is called becoming basmati um, and indeed that the question of what is basmati is is probably as complex as the question of what is organic um, and this was something I also discovered through the the course of my research um, so the government of India, you saw the export quality standards for organic basmati rice. More recently, um, India's introduced a geographical indication for basmati, um, but it is only those varieties of basmati 
um, that are on the list of government notified varieties of basmati rice. These are varieties that have been produced usually in public sector breeding programs um, that are seen to be basma, authentic basmati. Um, what I found in, in the Dune Valley, as I mentioned, it's a region that is famous for its basmati rice um, and also its land races. Um, but often these land races didn't meet the physical characteristics of export quality basmati rice. So they had they shared certain qualities in terms of um, the aroma and the kind of the texture and the flakiness of the grain. But um, the land races were often quite short grained when they were uncooked. And it was only after cooking that the grain would lengthen um, and become sort of thin and slender and the kind of typical qualities that show the typical qualities that one associates with basmati. Um, but because, because the grains, when they were uncooked, were short and sort of fat or, or bold, as they're called, um, these land races were not recognized to be basmati. Um, so, you know, I think I think this was a, was a further issue that that farmers um, faced in that they couldn't grow their basmati land races. For example, there wasn't real kind of commercial demand for them because of the physical characteristics um, of of the grain. Um, but I would say this was maybe more of an issue than at least for them than, than the issue of adulterated or, or fake basmati. Um, I would, yeah, I think, you know, I would love to, to kind of explore that world of adulterated and fake um, basmati, but I think one sees it perhaps more, yeah, in, at, the, at the consumption, you know, in the consumption um, or the kind of wholesale or retailing of, of rice um, rather than in the production side. It's amazing. And this chapter that Shaila's referring to for like, cause like material semiotics are like kind of really hip and cool right now, like, right. And, and anthropology, right. Especially thinking about quality, it's a really kind of great kind of right thing to think with in terms of like, how do we, how do we do material semiotic analysis? So it's really, really fabulous. Um, yeah, okay. I think um, everyone loves rice. And <laughs> I know, I don't want to, like, I'm like really excited to go uh, rice shopping again. But uh, please join me in uh, thanking uh, Shyla for a really fabulous talk. And again, if you haven't checked out the book, please do so.